All right, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, Night Before the Physics Paper 1 uh, revision video. Um, we're going to try and go through uh, as many things as we can to uh, just get you prepared for your exam tomorrow. A um, couple of things I want to just mention at the start. Um, you know, think about your body and, and looking after it, your mind as well. So get a good night's sleep tonight. Make sure you eat a really good breakfast tomorrow morning. Um, double check your equipment. You're going to need a pen, pencil, ruler, calculator. Now, do bring in a protractor. Your protractor is definitely needed for physics paper two exam, but um, it's always good practice just to have one uh, with you there. OK, so just a little bit uh, of information about today's Hangout. We're going to start off with some of the required practical information because that forms 15 percent of your exam. Uh, we're going to cover some of the math skills that you need, and physics contains about 30% um, uh, math uh, skills. And then we're going to cover um, the majority of the knowledge that we need. Now, we've split it up into combined uh, foundation, combined higher, and separate as well. Um, so the first part of the video, about the first hour or so, will be for combined foundation, obviously also for the higher and, and separate. And then after that, we'll do a little bit of the higher content, and then we'll finish off with some of the separate content. And I'll let you know as we go through the video about which, uh, when to, when you can stop watching. Okay, so let's get started then. So some of these required practicals we're going to look at. We're going to first off look at our finding the density of objects. Then there's about two or three uh, three uh, required practicals in finding the resistance of electrical components. Then we're going to go off and have a little look at specific heat capacity experiment. And then uh, uh, one about insulating materials if you're a separate scientist. OK, so the first. Um, the first required practical is about finding the density of objects. Now, this is a, uh, uh, an equation that you're going to need to know, and it's uh, density equals mass over volume. And a nice way of remembering this is dim of, uh, because density is mass over volume. So dim of is a nice way of remembering this. Uh, mass over volume also gives us the units for density as well. So the units for mass are kilograms, units for volume are meters cubed, and that similarly gives us our units for density there. Okay, so how would we do a required practical for finding this? Well, the first thing is we've got to find these things in the equation. So weigh your mass, um, find your mass on your scales, mention that you're using scales as well in the in the mass scheme, so that's where you're going to find your mass from. Now, if your object is like a, a regular shaped object, like a cuboid, so something with straight edges, well then to find the volume of this object here, we need to do our width times our length times our height. Okay, and that will give us our volume. Now, just pay attention when you're doing this in the exam whether they're going to want you to give the answer in centimetres cubed or whether that might be in metres cubed, okay, because that will change the units that's in the, um, in, in the density there. Okay, what else might we be doing? We might be finding the uh, regular, we might be finding the volume of a cuboid. We might be needing to find the volume of a liquid. Now, if we do need to find the volume of a liquid, we're going to pop it into a measuring cylinder, and that liquid, whatever it reads on the measuring cylinder, one milliliter is one centimeter cubed. Should it be an odd shaped object, so something like a Lego man or a chess piece, uh, what you're going to need to do then is use something called a Eureka can. Uh, you don't need to name it, but you need to be able to describe it. So a can with a spout, that part there is called a spout. You're going to drop this mysterious brown object into the uh, into the water there, and then that's going to displace um, a volume of water. That volume of water is going to go into the measuring cylinder, and the volume that you read off the measuring cylinder is the volume of the object that you dropped into it. Okay, once you've found your mass, you've weighed that, then you've got your volume from one of these stages over here. Then you're going to put it into your equation, so your uh, density equals mass over volume. Okay, and that will give you your final uh, calculation. Okay, that's the first required practical then. Okay, the next set of required practicals is really about finding resistance in an electrical circuit. Now, just before we start, don't forget what uh, a couple of key definitions here. Current is the rate of flow of charges around a circuit. So in our case, normally electrons in an electri uh, electrical circuit. And resistance is anything that slows down that current. So the higher the resistance, the lower the current flowing around it. OK, so in these circuits, if we're going to be finding the resistance of a component, we really need to know our equation V equals IR. OK, just so happens that my grand's name is Vera, and that's how I remember this, because we call her V, and that helps me to know this equation. Now, the units for that voltage or potential difference is measured in volts. Current is in amps, and that's why the ammeter is with the letter A, and resistance is measured in ohms. OK, if I want to find out the resistance of an unknown component, in this case here we've got a 
resistor. If I want to find out the resistance of this resistor, I need to use my equation, V equals IR, rearrange it to find that R equals V over I, and I'll be showing us just a, a reminder of how to rearrange equations later. So now I take my voltmeter reading and my ammeter reading, and it's important to know where those go. They really do like asking you about where to put the ammeter. That goes in series, meaning it's on the, the, the same uh, wire as the resistor. And our voltmeter goes in parallel. Okay, so our voltmeter is finding the difference in the energy um, provided by the, uh, carried in by the, by the charges and leaving. So it finds the difference, the potential difference. Therefore, the wire is connected to either side of the resistor. Okay, if we wanted to find out, for example, how voltage affects current, so how can I change voltage and what would be the effects on current for any component? Um, well, then how do I do that? What we're going to need to do is we're going to need to introduce a variable resistor here. And that variable resistor lets me change the resistance R. Now, when the resistance goes up, that's going to make um, the current in the, uh, in the circuit, it's going to make the current go down. Okay, and that's also going to mean that the share of the, of the voltage across here will go up as well. So, steps to do then. I'm going to use a variable resistor to change my voltage while measuring the current through the component. Okay, you might need to plot, possibly plot a graph of I versus V, of current versus voltage. So just using that to change the voltage in it, and then measuring our ammeter reading, our voltmeter reading, and using, again, V rearranged to be I equals V over I. So, for example, if we're writing out a method, you would want to just note down your independent variable first, the thing we change each time. You're going to be changing the potential difference in the circuit uh, across this component. We're going to be measuring the current through here. We're going to have a control variable of being the, the component that we're testing and perhaps keeping the same length of wires in our, in our investigation. Okay, so these are three examples of things you might need to, to, to prove how the voltage affects the current. And we can see here that these are three current voltage graphs, and that this first graph is for our resistor that we have just here. Now, this resistor follows Ohm's law, and what that means is that the current and the voltage are directly proportional. Remembering that directly proportional has to go through point zero zero, and it's going to be a straight line through the origin. Now, this only works, this is only true, while the resistor is under a constant temperature. Because if the temperature starts to change, then we see that the, that the graph would change. Now, a filament bulb, so the bulb that gets hot when it's on. Um, this does follow Ohm's law at low, uh, low voltages. Um, but as the voltage increases, the bulb gets hot. And as the bulb gets hot, the resistance increases. Okay, so the line becomes less steep here. So the flatter the line on these, the higher the resistance. And that also helps us with our last component here as well, a diode. Now, the job of a diode is really described by this graph here that when the voltage is in the negative direction, there is no current flowing. So what's the job of it? The job of it is to only let current flow in, it through in one direction. And that's denoted here with this kind of arrow here to say that it can only flow in one direction. Okay, another required practical is we need to know how to put uh, resistors in series and put resistors in parallel. So here we have a look at adding them in series. This is my one resistor. If I want to introduce a second resistor and I want to find how that affects the resistance in it, well, same equation again, V, rearranged to R equals V over I, add the resistors in series and record the voltage across all the resistors and the current around the circuit. So notice that my voltmeter is on either side of the resistors there and there, not just across one. Okay, use that equation again, V. And we find that when I put them in series, they add up. So if I had two 10 ohm resistors, that would equal in total 20 ohms. Okay, so we would find that as I add more resistors, uh, as I add put all of these resistors uh, in series, that we would find it's directly proportional with the um, uh, with increasing number of resistors uh, with the with the resistance. Okay, adding these resistors in parallel then. So when I put them in parallel, again, notice that my voltmeter is across uh, both of them. Uh, not just one, okay, but actually put carefully at the end of both of them. Now, uh, again, really similar. Add your resistors in parallel, record the voltage across both of them and the current around the circuit. Use my equation again, V. Okay, now this time you don't need to know how much uh, it gets to, but you just need to know that it gets less. Now, the reason why it gets less is that there are now two paths for the current to flow down. 
Okay, and because there's two paths, it means that the current, which is the flow of electrons, the current can get through quicker, therefore having a higher current. Okay, and we find that this has an inversely proportional relationship. So the more I add uh, in parallel, the lower the resistance gets. Okay, our third electrical uh, required practical is to do with a changing the length of a wire and seeing how that affects the resistance in the wire. So first step is we use crocodile clips here to attach uh, our cables to this length of long length of wire. And the length of wire is on a ruler. Now let's start taking our first length as 10 centimeters. We're gonna place again our voltmeter in parallel. We're going to place our ammeter in series, so we can just see it's on, on our single loop around here. We're going to use V, R equals V over I, to find the resistance again. We're going to repeat that for other lengths. We're going to move our crocodile clips up. We're going to repeat it three times. We're going to find our mean, discarding any anomalies. Okay, and it's just showing us at a, at a greater length, then we could go up in tens. Now, uh, couple of important bits of safety to do with this experiment. Um, so if we want to make sure that we're getting good results and that we're keeping safe as well, well, we want to make sure it doesn't get too hot. So we can turn it off between readings. That's going to be good because it's going to mean that the wire doesn't get hot. And if the wire doesn't get hot, um, that won't affect the resistance of, of in the wire as well. Okay, specific heat capacity then. So this is the definition of it. It's, uh, it decides how much energy it takes to increase the temperature of one kg of material by one degree C. Because if you heat different objects up with the same amount of heat going into them, they'll have different temperatures at the end. Okay, so this is like a property uh, of the materials called specific heat capacity. Now, the good news with this is, is you get given the equation for this. So on your equation sheet is your specific heat capacity equation. Really important that you know it's there and you go and look for it if they have any questions to do with specific heat capacity. Write it in the margin, write it above the question. <clears throat> it's going to be really useful for you. So a few things. It tells you all this on the equation sheet, but it tells you that the energy uh, transferred, this is the energy put into this block here. So we're going to put heat into it, called energy, and we are going to need to know the uh, mass of the block we're going to need to know the temperature change, this theta symbol here, the temperature change of the block, um, uh, in order to find out the C specific heat capacity of it. Okay, the metal block, when we write out this method, the metal block should be insulated. Well, why would we want to insulate it? It's because the heat we put into the block, we want to stay in the block. We don't want to be heating up the air around it, so we're going to insulate it. Okay, there's two versions of this uh, specific heat capacity required practical. And for both of them, you're gonna need to write out that equation at the top. And again, this is gonna help us how to find the method. Okay, step one, if we've gotta find, if we're looking to find C, they want us to calculate the specific heat capacity. Well, first thing is measure the mass of the block M. Okay, so you can tick that off on your equation sheet. Let me just make that a bit clearer. Tick that off, we wanna find C. Okay, so now I'm going to insulate the block, take my starting temperature. That's going to help me find the temperature change. Turn on my heater for 5, 10, 20 minutes. Record the energy E transferred to the block using a joule meter. So this thing here, our energy going into the block, well, that's energy is measured in joules, hence we use a joule meter to measure it. And you might add on your diagram, you might add a box and just label that joule meter. Okay, so that your examiner knows that that's the method that you're using here. So you're going to record the energy that goes into it E. You're going to turn off the heater and write down the final temperature. This lets you find theta. So I've now found my change in temperature. I know my mass already. I know my energy gone into the block. Okay, well, what do I do now? I just have to say I'm going to rearrange that. You don't actually have to rearrange it in the question to get full marks. Um, some of you may wish to do that. Um, it's quite okay just to say that's the equation I'm using and I'm going to use that to find my specific heat capacity. Uh, we'd always recommend repeating the experiment a couple of times, letting the block, oh, excuse me, letting the block cool down a couple of times um, and repeating the whole experiment. Okay, the complete version for this then is just a little bit more complicated but um, equally valid. So how to find the specific heat capacity of a material? Well, this time, similar sort of pattern. We're going to find the mass of the block M. We're now going to take the starting temperature and insulate it. We're going to turn on the heater. We're going to time how long it is this time. This is going to give us our value T. 
we're going to take the ammeter reading. Now, if you're going to do this method, make sure you know your ammeter is in series. And then you're going to record your voltmeter reading across this heater here. This is the heater going into the aluminium block. You're going to need to make sure that's in parallel with the heater. Then you're going to use power equals I times V to calculate the power of the heater. Then you're going to use, to find out the energy transferred to find this here, you're going to use power times time, so the time that I recorded earlier, to calculate the energy transferred to the block E, so that that would mean I now have my E. Take the final temperature and calculate the change in temperature. So that gives me that one again. And again, same, rearrange the equation to find C. Okay, I'll just leave that up there for a moment. Have a quick look at the, uh, at the comments. Okay, great question there. Well, voltage and potential difference, the same thing. Um, great question. Yes, voltage and potential difference are the same thing. In your answers, you can refer to it as either, and you'll still get full marks. The questions will ask about potential difference, uh, but as long as you know that they're the same thing. Okay, nice to see some of my class watching uh, today. I'm just going to mention a few initials there. So well done, TP. Well done, JD. Nice to see you watching. Okay, here we have a required practical, which is a separate science required practical, but I've included it here um, because uh, it could also come up. This, they may ask you about the results here for, for combined foundation or higher. So let's have a look at this. And this is us comparing the rate of heat loss of different insulating materials. Basically means wrapping hot um, containers with different materials. Now, all you have to do, place different insulating materials around a container with hot water in it, take the starting temperature, record the temperature every 30 seconds, plot a graph of time against temperature change to see the rate of heat loss. Now, what, what are the results going to look like? Well, up here, what's this? That's our, that's our starting temperature of the water inside here. They all start at the same temperature. OK, and then what do these different lines mean? Well, the one that's cooled down the most, the one with the worst insulating material, is going to be this one because it hasn't kept the heat in. So our temperature has gone down to the lowest. And this one here, that one has been the most effective insulating material. So that's kept the most heat in. Um, so this one has had a slower or a reduced rate of heat loss. OK, so that's our required practicals then, meaning we're now going to have a little look at some of the math skills. Um, math skills taken up about 30% of, um, of the paper. OK, so with these math skills, let's have a look at some of our equations and see how we're doing. Now, uh, pressure equals force over area. Kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Now, these are the ones we actually need to recall here, OK? So kinetic energy is a half mv squared. Uh, gravitational potential energy is mgh, so mass times gravity times height. And a couple of power equations, basically the same equation. Power equals energy over time and power equals work done over time. And they're basically the same equation because energy transferred is the work done. OK, and here we have efficiency. So if I want to know the efficiency, it's like how much useful stuff is coming out of a machine compared to the total amount of stuff I put in. And I say stuff because we can have either this in terms of energy or we can have it in terms of power. So it's the useful output divided by the total input. OK, some of our units then. Now, pressure is measured in pascals, P. Force is in newtons. I would really recommend that for, you know, foundation combined students to really make sure that you, uh, you, you know that for your, your paper two um, uh, uh, physics paper. OK, area in metre squared, work done. So here we go, joules, energy, joules, hence they're the same thing. Uh, now, power is measured in watts. Uh, mass is measured in kilograms. I'm just going to come back to that in a second. Height is measured in meters. Now, the reason why I've highlighted that red is that mass is the only one that has one of these prefixes in it as the SI unit. If you notice, none of these others say milli, micro, nano, giga, none of them do. And mass is the only one that does. So be prepared. If they give you in a question, they say something is measured in kg, you don't need to change it. It's, that is correct. OK, we want mass to be measured in kilograms. OK, a few more equations then. So our uh, electricity equations here. Quit. Charge equals current times time. Veer. OK, my nan's name. Um, potential difference equals current times resistance. Piv. P equals IV. Or P equals V times I. OK, P equals I squared R. 
So this is power, uh, current, and voltage. Power is current squared, time resistance. And then we have E equals P times T. Uh, one relating charge flow. So the flow of charge times the potential difference gives us our energy transferred. And then I would say that this one is a pivotal one to know. That's the, our first required practical. And this one as well. We've already mentioned these two a number of times because they're that important. Make sure that you know those two without fail. Okay, some of our units then. So charge is measured in coulombs. Uh, current in amps, potential difference V. Resistance is in ohms. Okay, power is in watts. Energy is in joules. The mass again, kilograms, making sure you know it's supposed to have that kg there. Now density, we can use, we can work out these units, like I said earlier, from the uh, equation because it's mass divided by volume. Okay, now you might need to select equations from a sheet. Um, if you do, look for keywords in the question, underline those keywords, for example, specific heat capacity. It may well say, go and have a look at um, uh, the equation sheet to help you. If you're looking for specific heat capacity, just scan through all of the words in here. There we go, there it is, scan through the rest. Can I see it? No, I can't. This is your equation you need for specific heat capacity. You're then gonna write down that, making sure you know what each thing in it means and you're then going to substitute in your values from the question okay so here's an example then uh, the energy e transferred to the water was 10 uh, was 1050 joules the time taken for the water temperature to increase was that so temperature increase i know is theta now it says five minutes here so i'm going to write t and what should i do with five minutes i should times that by 60 to get it into seconds the specific heat capacity of the water is 4,200 joules. Calculate the mass. So there's my command word. Stick a box around it. Calculate the mass of the water. So I need to find M. And all of these things I'm doing around the question you can do in your exam. It makes it so much easier for when you look back. What am I looking for? M. Okay, nice and easy. What do I know? E. Lovely. Okay, theta. Okay. So use the correct equation from the physics equation sheet. So I've already underlined some of the things I'm looking for. I look down here through all of my list of equations in the exam paper. I see that that is my equation that I need. Okay, um, converting prefixes to units. So uh, some questions will have prefixes in we need to get rid of. Remembering that kg is okay. Anything else with a, uh, a milli or, um, you know, a, um, what could it be, milli, milli volts or a, a micro... Um, amps, you know, any of these prefixes here, we've got to get rid of, okay, unless it's on mass. So at the lowest point in the jump, the energy stored in the stretch bungee is 24.5 kilojoules. Okay, so I'm going to need to do something with that. The extension of the bungee cord is 10 meters. The bungee cord behaves like a spring. Calculate, box around that, calculate the spring constant of the bungee cord. And again, use the correct equation from the physics equation sheet. So the first thing is, is I'm going to look at the equation sheet. I'm looking for spring constant. So here it is, spring constant. That's what I want. Now I'm going to write up the whole equation first in symbols. Okay, that's really important that you do that. While there's no marks for that, if you don't do that step, you'll find it more difficult to substitute in the values correctly. And there is a mark for that step. So that like it says here, the convert first, your 24.5 killer. Now killer means thousand, so 24,500 joules. Okay, now substitute into the equation. So my elastic energy is 24,500 equals a half. So I literally write out the half again, 0.5 on my calculator, times by K, that's what I'm trying to find. And then my E squared, extension squared, 10 squared there. So now I do the sums that I can. So I know that I can do 10 squared is 100, 0.5 times 10 squared, 0.5 times 100 is 50. So I write down the sums that I can do straight away. Now I've got to get K on his own, and I can do the opposite to both sides to get K on his own. So if it's at the minute K times 50, I can divide both sides by 50 to get K on his own. And here we go, 2,450 um, divided by 50. Uh, sorry, 2,000, 24,500 divided by 50 equals K, hence K equals 490. Okay, should we get a five mark question? My main uh, advice to this is that this is gonna need two equations. So a really sensible thing to do is to identify here each um, variable that you're being given. Okay, by knowing that you're writing down 
the things given to you in the question is going to make it a lot easier for you to work out what equations to use. Okay, so mark off, just like I've done here, use the symbols next to each value to just make it easier for you to see which equations you might have to use. Okay, with our prefixes then. So with our prefixes, now there is a great video uh, that some of you know already on Revision Monkey, um, a short song uh, which is very addictive and very easy to learn the, how the prefixes work. I definitely recommend watching that um, if you haven't seen it already. Now, um, these ones make things bigger, so kilo, mega, giga, and these ones make things smaller, milli, micro, nano. And these are the symbols for them, okay? And giga, so if we need to turn 11 gigawatts into watts, we're gonna times by a billion, which is the same as timesing by 10 to the 9, 10 to the, 10 to the 9. Okay, mega then. You'll notice a pattern in this soon enough if you're not already aware of it. If I want to convert three megajoules into joules, I times that by a million, not a billion. Notice nine zeros, six zeros. I'm timesing that by one times 10 to the six. Killer, turn 3.2 kilovolts into volts. So I'm just timesing that by a thousand, one times 10 to the three. So look at the pattern. Times 10 to the nine, times 10 to the six, times 10 to the three. Now we're getting smaller, we're going to divide our numbers to get them into the SI unit. So convert 6.5 millijoules. We know we need to be dividing by whatever number because it needs to get smaller than 6.5 joules. So 6.5 divided by 1,000 or times 10 to the minus 3 is going to give us our uh, conversion. Micro, we're going to now divide by a million or times 10 to the minus 6. Nano, we're now going to divide by a, a billion, uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 9. So again, 9, 6, 3, minus 3, minus 6, minus 9. Okay, just up a question up on the wall up here. Is specific latent heat related to specific heat capacity? Um, I'm going to show us a, um, uh, a graph later where we'll be able to have a look at that. Um, so this question here using sig figs, significant figures. Uh, in this question, let's just use our exam technique up here. So we've got an output a power output of that, so that's going to be my P. When it's connected to the 230 volts, that's going to be a big V. The equation which links current potential difference and power is up here. They're giving us that in the question. Calculate the current passing, so I'm going to pop a box around that, underline that. Now give this to two significant figures. That is worth one mark, just like pretty much every other step in this, in this, in this question here. So we're going to write out our equation. We're going to substitute in our values, our P and our V. We're then going to write out what the calculator says on the page. Now, this says it wants to give it to two significant figures. So two significant figures means these two numbers here are the important ones. But you do have to look at the next number, okay? Because, I, yes, I'm going to write down the first two important numbers, but the next number will decide whether this last one here, the 6, needs to be rounded up or left the same. It needs to be rounded up if that number there is 5 or more. And it's going to stay the same if that number is, is less than 5. Now, as some examples, so this one will become 46. And some other examples are if they ask you for one significant figure, it's going to be 50. Because that first number is the most important. You're going to look at the next number, and that help tells you whether you should round that one up or not. Two sig figs, 46. Three sig figs. Let's clear some of my writing there. Three sig figs would be these ones. That 4 needs to be rounded up because the one after is a 7. So 64.5. And again, four sig figs would be these ones here. And again, that number after is an eight, so I've got to round up my seven. Okay, so that's why it's 46.48. Okay, rearranging equations then. So if we're going to rearrange an equation like V equals IR, um, we're going to need to have a blank equation triangle, and a blank equation triangle already comes with a times and two divided by signs in it. Now, the equation v, v equals IR already has a times by in it. So I use this to tell me where to put the symbols. So here, I is always times by R, I and R, meaning we've got to put V up here. Then how do you use this? Okay, you cover the thing you're looking for. So um, if here we want to find R, we're going to cover up R. We're going to cover that up, and we're going to do what's left from top to bottom, left to right. So in this case, R equals V over I. Okay, let's have a quick look at how to rearrange an equation with more than three terms in. For example, uh, gravitational potential energy equals mass times gravity times height. Let's say you're given this time, you're given EP, you're given M, you're given G. Okay, and I want to find the height, so I've got to rearrange this then. 
So first off, always write out the equation. That makes it easier for your next steps. Then subs in the values that you've been given. Okay, so in this case, my energy is 100. Pop in the 5 there. Pop in my G is 10. Um, do the sums you can. So just have a look at that and see what sums you can do. Okay, so we can do the 5 times 10. We're now just going to divide both sides by 50 to get the H on its own, meaning 100 divided by H, so H equals 2 metres. Okay, that is the end of our math skills. I'm going to quickly read, uh, read some of the questions on the wall. Um, uh, so what have we got here? Um, in the specific heat capacity question, no, they won't tell you what method that they, they want. Um, you choose the method that, that you feel comfortable describing. Um, I'm unclear exactly whether both um, whether the simpler method will definitely get you full marks, but the mark schemes I've seen indicate that they would. So if you don't know the more complicated version, definitely write out the simpler version of using the joule meter. Okay, if you did use in our required practical for the uh, displacement can for finding the density, someone has asked if um, if we use the Eureka can method to find the density of a regular object, would you get the marks? Well, I would like to say that you should get the marks because the, the method is still correct and it will still allow you to, to, to find the density. But if you can, try and, try and um, mention that for a regular object like a cuboid, you would do mass time, uh, width times length times height. Okay, should in the required practical for the for the separate one on heat loss, should you need to give examples of insulating materials, uh, it's not in your specification that you need, you need to name any types of insulating materials, but typical examples might be maybe some cloth, some felt, some towel, um, you know, paper, that sort of thing. Um, so nothing that you really need to um, need to worry about too much. Okay, let's have a look at some of our top tips then for the content that's coming up. Okay, the particle model is our, is our first um, um, topic in the revision guide. Some of the key terms for this topic is you need to know what a system is. So a system is basically the object or objects you're looking at. Now in this case, it could just be the water inside the kettle, or it could be a two object system. It could be the heating element that's at the bottom here. Uh, it could be the heating element that's at the bottom, as well as the particles that are inside it. And it will tell you that in the question, but a system is just the thing you're looking at. Okay, well, what's a closed system? So a closed system, just like having a, a shut door, is not where no energy or matter can enter or leave. Okay, so you, can, you don't have to worry about any heat coming out or any heat going in or anything like that. Now, internal energy, a really small definition here. Um, uh, internal energy, the definition for that is it's the total kinetic energy and the potential energy of all the particles in the system. Now, what's this due to? It's due to how quickly the particles move. That's the kind of kinetic energy of the particles. And their state of matter, meaning whether they're solid, liquid, or gas. If they're gas, they've got more potential energy. If they're a solid, they've got less potential energy. Okay, so in our particle model, um, we can describe, uh, there's certain um, descriptions that we can give for these particles. Um, and they can also explain their properties as well. So the key ideas of a solid are that the particles vibrate. Now, they're also in a regular arrangement. They're in neat rows. Now, they've got really strong forces of attraction. They're holding onto each other tightly, which explains why it has a fixed shape. The fact it doesn't flow is because they're holding onto each other tightly. They're really close together, and that means I can't squish them in. I can't compress them. So in my liquid, then, the particles are able to flow over each other, which explains, what, explains why they're in an irregular arrangement. So a little bit more random. They've got weak forces of attraction. Now this explains why they flow to the fill the bottom of a container, because they're slightly weaker than solids. And they're still close together, which explains why I still cannot compress a liquid. Okay, you can't squish a liquid. Now gas, key gas ideas then. So particles move in random directions with random speeds. This explains why particles are in an irregular arrangement. They move randomly. There are no forces of attraction. This explains why it fills the whole container when I put it in a box. And the particles are far apart. This explains why it can be compressed. And notice that my, my proper, my, um, the ideas of how, of, of how they behave explains their properties. So the fact that liquids fill the bottom of the container and can't be compressed. Make sure you're matching them up correctly. Okay, so gas pressure then. 
Uh, gas pressure is caused by particles hitting the walls of the container, and it's a measure of the force per unit area. Okay, so here we have a box with gas particles in it. Um, what is gas pressure? Well, it's when those particles collide with the wall. Okay, so how do we increase gas pressure? In a nutshell, it's making sure you understand this definition here. If I want to inc increase the gas pressure, what do I have to do? Well, I'm going to need to increase the temperature. Why? So they move faster and hit the wall more often. Reduce the volume, so I make the box smaller with the same number of particles in it. Why would that increase the pressure? Well, what is the pressure? It's the particles hitting the wall. So it must be because they hit the walls more often um, per unit area. And I can also put more particles in. Why would that increase the gas pressure? Well, because the particles are hitting the wall more, okay, because there are more of them. Okay, a little bit on specific latent heat then. This is a, an equation that you get given. Um, and I'm just going to refer us to this graph because they, they do love asking us about this. So this is a heating graph or heating curve. And what we've got along the bottom is time. And so we can think of this as a box with some, um, with some solid particles in it. In fact, here it is. Here's a box with some solid particles in. And I am heating this box. Like I'm heating it with a Bunsen burner, for example. And we can see that when I first start heating it, my temperature goes up. My temperature goes up until something happens. Now, if this was water, the melting point of this would be at 0 degrees C. Here we have my temperature scale up here. So here, my mixture now, my, not my mixture, my particles are now starting to melt. And so this is the point where melting is happening. Now, there is a certain amount of energy required to melt a solid. Okay, now this, once it's all melted, my temperature is going to keep going back up again. And then, once at the very top here, it's going to start to boil, and the temperature of this for liquid water would be 100 degrees C. And then again up here, my temperature is going to go up. So here we can see solid, liquid in the up upslope, and gas in the upslope there. And these flat parts, well, what is the heat being used for? What is the energy that's going into it? What's it doing? Well, the energy is breaking the bonds, as we can see here. The energy is being supplied to change the state. Okay, and there's a question earlier, is specific heat capacity related to this? Well, if you like, um, this topic of specific latent heat is talking about these sections where the energy is being used to change the state. Specific heat capacity is talking about um, the temperature change uh, depending, on, depending on how much energy is being put in. So our specific heat capacity is related to this section of the graph. Okay, that, that as I heat something up, the temperature goes up but only while it's not changing state. Here, they are changing state, so we have a different equation. So here we go, this is the energy needed to change the state on these sections here, how much energy is put in. So there are two different types of specific latent heat. One for this one here, and one for this one here. So the latent heat of vaporization is the energy needed to boil one kg of substance. So remember, vaporization, Making a vapor, making a gas is to do with the boiling. And the latent heat of fusion is to do with melting. And think fusion, you're fusing things together, so kind of the opposite of melting. Okay, keep your questions coming up on the uh, on the um, on the wall up there, and anything that pops up, I'll mention. Just want to give another couple of shout outs to uh, some of my class there, ZS and uh, TP again. Good to see you guys watching. Um, right, energy then. Top trip, top tips for transferring energy between stores, if I can say it. Um, so an important rule here in the energy topic: energy can't be created, it can't be destroyed. You can't magic energy out of nothing. You can't make it disappear. You can only transfer it from one store to another. Now, every time energy is transferred, there will be some wasted energy, usually heat, which warms up the surrounding air. So nearly all machines waste heat in one form or another, whether it be electrical heat generated or friction. So let's have a look at this example of transfers of energy. Let's say I've got a big roller coaster ride here and I want to place a car up on the top. Now, the work done that I use to lift that car, how much energy it takes me to lift it, is the energy that goes into the car in its gravitational potential energy store. So when I lift it, it's going to have its maximum um, gravitational potential energy at the top. And there he is, ready to go. Okay, as he starts to go down there, now what well, EP equals MGH. As he starts to go down the hill, 
the height goes down. That means that the potential energy goes down. Where's it going to? It's going to turn into the gravitational potential energy store decreases and the kinetic energy store increases. So we can see that my Ke, which equals a half mv squared, will start to go up. My kinetic energy starts to go up. Why? Because my velocity starts to go up as he goes down the hill. Okay, at the bottom of the hill, he's going to have his maximum kinetic energy. He's at his maximum speed at the bottom of the hill. Now, down here, he's going to hit the brakes. The brakes are going to get red hot, and the car's going to stop. Now, the kinetic energy store decreases. Okay, his kinetic energy store is going to disappear as the thermal store in the brakes increases due to the heat from the friction. Okay, and each time it's the same amount, exactly the same value. So, for example, if I said that the work goes in was five joules, well, then his gravitational potential energy equals five joules. His kinetic energy um, at the bottom here would be equal to five joules. And the work done released as heat um, would be, uh, work done would be equal to five joules as well. Okay, so the energy is transferred each time. Now we're 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 being a bit generous here that the uh, there would be some wasted energy each time, but for simplicity, we we'll just ignore that. Okay, a little bit more about energy then. So imagine you were going to be asked to compare the cost effectiveness of two different types of appliance. So it could be bulbs, it could be fridges, could be anything else. Now they love asking about cost effectiveness. So let's have a look at this data here. We've got two types of bulb. Solaro and Luxmore. Here's their cost to buy. Here's how long they last, their lifetime. And this is their running costs per year. Okay, typical question then. Compare the cost effectiveness of the two types of bulb over a 10-year period. That is a really important thing. Compare, so stick a box around that, and we want to compare the cost effectiveness. So you need to work out the entire price of buying enough bulbs over the period and the running costs over that period as well. So you've got to buy enough bulbs and you've got to work out the running costs over that 10 year period. That way you'll know basically which is cheaper, which is more cost effective. OK, so let's do exactly that then. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the first bulb and we're going to say, what is the total cost for it? Well, how many of those will you need to buy to cover 10 years and how much are the running costs going to be for 10 years? Now, you're going to need because it only lasts one year, you're going to need 10 of those. These ones running cost per year, you're going to need to 10 of that as well. And similar for Luxmore for the other one, this one lasts two years. Each bulb lasts two years. So if I want to cover a 10 year period, I need five of those. But the running costs are still per year, so I need 10 of those. So here's my calculations then cost of the bulb, £1.50 times 10. You can see up here. Running costs, £2.50 times 10. So I add those two values together, making um, Solaro bulbs cost £40 over 10 years. Next, Luxmore bulbs, £2.50 times 5. It's 5 because it's, each one lasts for two years, and I've got to cover 10 years. So £2.50 times twelve uh, 5. Running costs, 50p times 10 years, giving me a total of just adding those two values together, £17.50. Okay, so I can see my conclusion is Luxmore bulbs are more cost-effective. Okay, energy resources and their uses. This is your renewable energies, non-renewable energies, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, renewable energies then, definition, they won't run out. Non-renewable, they will run out. Okay, so I'll put them into a few different categories. Let's look at some of these names here. Solar power, wind power, wave power, hydroelectricity. If you're not sure what that one is, hydro is kind of like a Greek word for water. That's falling water, so damming up rivers. Um, biofuels, bio meaning living things. So it's crops and wood. Tidal power. That's our tides going in and out twice a day based on the uh, moon that goes around our planet. And geothermal, geo meaning earth and thermal meaning hot. So this is hot rocks under the, under the ground. Okay. Now, some key points here. Um, these ones are renewable ones are free energy. Really worth saying that, that once it's set up, it's free. They're not always reliable. So which ones are not reliable? Solar, wind, wave, they all depend on the weather. Now, these next ones could really be described as, as reliable. Geothermal only works in certain places, though. Um, you might need lots of them to supply our energy needs. Okay, you'll need thousands of wind turbines to replace a coal power station, for example. 
Okay, non-renewable. So these are our fossil fuels um, from the dead remains of plants and animals from millions of years ago. These will run out. We dig them out of the ground. So a couple of key problems with this. Damage to the environment, producing carbon dioxide. Name it. Okay, don't say polluting gases. Name it. You know the name of it. Call it carbon dioxide. What does it cause? Global warming. Now, at the minute, these provide most of our energy needs. And, and that's an important thing for you to know. Okay, at the minute, we use mostly these. Okay, why do we use mostly these? Well, they are reliable. You know, they're always going to be there. They can supply most of our demand. Non-renewable. There's one other non-renewable one, which isn't a fossil fuel, but it will run out one day as nuclear. And why does it run out? It's because we dig the fuel out of the ground, uranium. Okay, and there's only so much uranium on our planet, but it will last thousands of years. Now, a good thing about this, you get lots of energy from a small mass of fuel. That means we don't need lots of transport carrying um, trains, train loads of coal up and down the country or pipes carrying gas up and down. Now, there is a small risk of disaster. If the disaster happens, the disaster is pretty bad, um, like Chernobyl, the um, Russian um, Ukrainian power station that, that blew up in the 80s. And the good thing about this is there's no polluting gases, so no CO2 Okay, when the electricity is being made. Okay, question about whether in, in energy transfers, whether you can mention sound energy is a wasted energy. Um, if you can, I would definitely go for heat first. Heat is the most common form of energy loss. Um, you know, 99% of the time the answer would be heat. Um, and I guess if it's for a specific thing, maybe like a washing machine, uh, yep, yeah, sound would be a wasted form of energy and, and that should be given on the mark scheme. Um, someone else asking, do we get the equation for specific heat capacity or specific latent heat? Yes, you get given both of those, which is good news. Okay, on to the electricity topic. We've covered a lot of this already in the uh, required practicals. So here we're just going to cover a few things to do with electrical safety. Now, a few key things for you to know here. Uh, the UK main supply, so what we get out of plugs, is AC. Now, if I was to draw that on a graph there, alternating current so the um the voltage goes backwards and forwards uh or, and the current does go backwards and forwards potential difference is 230 volts you just got to remember that for 24 hours and you'll never need to know it again 230 volts and our frequency is 50 hertz okay a few things about our plug then now the color of these wires on the plug tells us where they go so the live one is brown uh, the earth wire is striped, our neutral wire is uh, blue, and you can probably tell from the way I've written it, the second letter, it tells you where it goes. So we've got blue on the left, we've got striped at the top, we've got brown on the right. Okay, a few bits of safety to do with this then. So the live wire, that provides the alternating current and it carries a voltage of 230 volts on it. It can give you a shock if you touch it. This neutral wire here, what's its job? Well, it completes the circuit. Just like in a traditional circuit with a bulb, you'd never try and light a bulb up with just the live wire. Uh, you would need to also have a wire that returned it back to the um, cell as well. Okay, what about this earth wire then? So it's not involved in sending electricity to the component or back again. Um, but it does, it, inside the machine, it connects to the metal case. So something like a fridge or an oven or a freezer, if the live wire inside comes loose and touches the metal case, well, instead of going through you, the current flows down the earth wire, not through you. And that's because it has a really low resistance. Okay, and electricity wants to take the path of least resistance, so it goes down the earth wire, not you. Now here's a question, typical question, engineer's fixing a plug socket. Uh, he has switched the switch to the off position. Explain how the electrician can still get a shock. Okay, well, there's a large potential difference in the live wire, 230 volts. The man will provide a path for the current to go to ground. Um, the current will flow through him, giving him a shock. Okay, some circuit symbols here. See if you can spot a pattern amongst everything that's a type of resistor while I quickly check the wall. Okay, so there's a few patterns in these, uh, in, these uh, in these circuit symbols. If it's something with a rectangle in it, it's a type of resistor. So there's just your basic resistor. 
you put a line through it, it's a resistor that can change. If it's got an arrow at the end, it's a variable resistor. If you get rid of the arrow at the end and have a flat line there, it's a thermistor. So resistor, variable resistor, thermistor. There's one more as well, an LDR. So an LDR can be spotted because it's a type of resistor, light dependent resistor. And it's got these two arrows that go into the uh, symbol because that is the light being detected. And similarly, just like you've got light uh, coming in here, well here we've got light coming out, that's our LED. The most common ones you're gonna need to know, voltmeter, ammeter, lamp, cell, switch. Okay, two components you need to know a little bit more about, uh, LDRs and thermistors. Here are the examples for them. So example is a street light, on the top there is an LDR. Thermistors will be in a thermostat, or also in a kettle or oven. Here are their circuit symbols for them both. And you need to know the relationship between, in this case for an LDR, light, and for thermistor, um, temp. You need to know the relationship between those things and its job of changing the resistance. So here's the first one. Okay, so for an LDR, when I have, uh, as I increase the light, the resistance goes down. Okay, it's got that shape of graph, inversely proportional, and exactly the same again for thermistor. So when we have uh, lots of heat and it's hot, we have a low resistance. Now, should you be asked to um, explain how to place an LDR into a circuit? If you want an LDR to decide when a light comes on, we need to place the LDR in parallel, um, in parallel to the bulb. So here it is. Okay, I'm back to my cell. Excuse the slightly childish drawing there. So uh, I'm placing my LDR in parallel to the light so that when, uh, when it's daylight, and we don't want the bulb to be lighting up in daylight, in daylight, you're gonna have a low resistance in the LDR. If this has a low resistance, the light will pass through it. Sorry, the electricity will pass through it. The electricity will pass through here, not through the bulb meaning the bulb stays off in day, in daylight. So off in daylight. Now the opposite would happen at nighttime. So at nighttime, you can see from the, grass, uh, from the graph here that at nighttime, we would have low light. We would have a high resistance, high resistance on the uh, LDR, meaning that the electricity can't go through the LDR, it will go through the bulb instead. So it will be on in daylight. Now for a, Thermistor, it really does depend whether you're going to turn on a cooling device or turn on a heater as to whether it wants to be in series or parallel. Okay, national grid. So the national grid, we don't need to know loads about this, but this part is the national grid. So this is a diagram showing as a power station, step up transformer, pylons, cables, pylons, step down transformer are homes. The national grid is a series of cables and step up and step down transformers. That makes the national grid. So power stations and houses are not included. Now, what do we need to know about step up and step down transformers? Well, we need to know that a step up transformer increases the voltage to reduce the energy loss in the cables. Okay, so we need to increase the voltage. So a nice way of thinking about that is a step up. Okay, U is next to V in the alphabet. That's how we remember that step up increases voltage. Okay, and both of these refer to voltage. So step up, increase the voltage, reduce the energy lost as heat in the cables. And here we have the step down transformer. Why? It makes it safe to go back into the house so that we don't um, die should we get accidentally get um, an electric shock. Okay, onto the um, radiation atomic structure um, topic. Let's start with our gold leaf scattering experiment. So this is Rutherford's gold leaf alpha particle scattering experiment. We're gonna start off with the plum pudding model. Uh, plum pudding, large sphere of positive charge. Okay, electrons randomly scattered inside. Now, what was the experiment then? So they wanted to fire um, alpha particles. This is my source of alpha particles here. They wanted to fire it at a thin layer of gold leaf. So here is my gold leaf, side on. Gold leaf is great because you can make it one or two atoms thick. Now, they wanted to fire these alpha particles through it. What did they expect would happen? They expected that nearly all of them, all of the alpha particles would pass straight through. Okay, well, what did they actually find? 
They found that most did pass straight through, but some were deflected a little bit. And this one, they're really unexpected. Very few, a tiny number, deflected back to the source. They actually rebounded back to where they came from. Now, this proved to us that this model couldn't be right. And this is how, this is what it did prove. So the fact that most, mo, the fact that most pass straight through can only be explained because our new model of the atom says it's mostly empty space. Some deflected just a little bit, and that's because we're firing positive alpha particles at a positively charged nucleus. And when they get close, they will deflect a little bit. And then just a few, just a few that were fired straight at the nuclei, rebounded back, which tells us that the nucleus is very small. It's tiny, and it has a concentrated mass. So this is what, how we describe the nuclear model. Mostly empty space, positively charged nucleus. The nucleus is small and has concentrated mass. Okay, so here we have our nuclear model. Our electrons orbit in shells or energy levels. And we can also say some properties of the, um, we can also describe the properties of some of these particles. Now, don't be scared by this word here. Subatomic just means proton, electron, neutron. Okay, you know those really well. Don't worry about that word there. That's what it means. So we know the relative charge of these things. Now, protons are per, 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 per positive, plus one. Uh, neutrons are neutral, zero, meaning electrons are minus one. Now, the relative mass of these, all of the mass of an atom is found in the nucleus. So what's in the nucleus? Proton has a mass of one. Neutron has a mass of one. Electron, very small. OK, we have here um, our uh, symbol from the periodic table. This is the same as in chemistry, this part of the topic. Our top number is our mass number. That's our total protons and neutrons. Bottom number is just the atomic number. That's just the number of protons, which also happens to be the same as the number of electrons. If I want to find the number of neutrons, I've got to find the difference between these two numbers here. So top number or bigger number, take away smaller number. Now an isotope is a different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons. So lithium-8, for example, has one more neutron, same number of protons. So here's my proton number. They've both got three. This one here has got four neutrons. That one there has got five neutrons. Okay, nuclear radiation, though, are alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, let's have a quick look at some of these examples here. Well, what is alpha radiation made of? It's a helium nucleus, um, two protons, two neutrons. Um, because it's two protons, two neutrons, it's got a plus two charge. Beta particles, what do we know about that? It's a high energy electron from the nucleus and it has a minus one charge because it's an electron. And gamma radiation is an EM wave, doesn't have any charge because it's not a particle. Okay, what else do we need to know? What are they stopped by? Alpha radiation stopped by paper. Beta radiation stopped by thin layer of aluminium. Gamma radiation stopped by thick lead. Now, we also need to know their ionizing power. That means stripping electrons from um, atoms. Alpha radiation is the most highly ionizing. Makes sense because it's the most highly charged. Gamma radiation is not really very ionizing at all. Um, can be dangerous in large levels, though, of course, because it can pass straight through you. So our range in, these, uh, in, in air, well, less than five centimeters for alpha. So on the outside of your body, really quite safe. Inside of your body, awful. Uh, range in air for gamma radiation is over kilometers. Okay, now should we put them into an electric field, uh, they will be deflected, they'll be attracted to the different um, charge plates. So beta particles are negative, that's why they go to the positive. Alpha particles are pol positively charged, so that's why they go to the negative plate. And gamma radiation, no charge, so goes straight through. Okay, half-life. Um, half-life of a radioactive material is the time taken for the radioactive count rate to go down by half, how many counts it's giving out per second. It's the time taken for the number of radioactive atoms to go down by half. So there's a couple of skills here they're going to ask you to do. Um, the count rate or the radioactivity of any radioactive substance goes down over time, just gets less and less. So let's have a look at the half-life of a material. Let's say material X has a half-life of two years. 
the count rate starts at 240 counts per second. That's CPS there, starts at 240 counts per second. Now, after two years, it's going to go down to 120. After another two years, it's going to go down to 60, noticing it's going down by half. Then after another two years, it goes down by half again. Then the next one will be 15. Now, that could be one of the skills, working out what the count rate would be after a certain number of years. Just write down, just halve it each time and count how many times it's halved. Now, the skill that they may well ask you is they'll show you a graph and they'll say find the half-life. So I've got two graphs here. How to find the half-life from a graph? The first thing to do is what is my starting count rate or my number of nuclei? So here we've got the count rates per second. We're starting at 80. Here we've got the number of nuclei, uh, the, the number of radioactive atoms starts off at 100. So there's my starting rate on both these graphs. Halve it. So here we go, 100 down to 50. And just at the same time, I'll do this one as well. So here's 80 down to 40, so I've halved it. I'm gonna now draw a line to the graph, to the line and draw down to time. So here we go. So across from 50, that looks to me to be about 10. So my half-life here, that is my half-life, is 10 seconds. And here, I'm gonna draw it across to here, and it looks like that should be just slightly less than two. Now, be prepared on these graphs, This this is not the type of graph that you'll have in your exams. Be prepared that you have to be accurate to within half a square. That's about half a millimetre on your graphs. Okay, we're getting towards the end of the combined specification here. Um, so just a couple more minutes for those people still listening um, in, on combined foundations. So nuclear decay equations then. They, these look rather scary down here. I've got some already written out for us. Now alpha, beta and gamma radiation are all emitted by the nucleus. And a neutron can also be emitted during decay. So each one of those could, could be called radioactive decay. Uh, isotopes that are unstable will release um, alpha, beta, or gamma radiation. So here's some examples. You're going to have to find the new mass number or the new atomic numbers. So let's have a go at this. What are the golden rules to this then? First golden rule is the top numbers must balance on both sides of the arrow. So let's look at this first one. Two, three, five. On the left of the arrow. On the right of the arrow, four. So I want to know what is that number? Well, if they need to balance, 2, 3, 5, it's going to have to be the same as some number plus 4. So 2, 3, 5 minus 4 is going to give me 2, 3, 1. Now, also, the bottom numbers must balance on both sides of the arrow. So this is for beta, beta radiation being given out. And beta radiation shows that I'm going to have 14 on the left, a 0 there, meaning that must be 14, 2 as well. And over here, we've got 6. And this needs to balance with something minus one. Well, what minus one would equal six? That's going to be seven. Okay, so the effect of beta radiation is it makes the atomic number go up by one. It makes the mass number stay the same. What's the effect of alpha radiation? Mass number goes down by four. And the mass number goes down by two. Gamma radiation is lovely. No change. Okay, irradiation and contamination then. So if I irradiate something, it's like me shining a torch of alpha, beta, or gamma radiation at something. It's, it's useful for sterilizing medical equipment or treating cancer. Now, it can come out in a stream and it can hit an object. That object is not radioactive afterwards or dangerous. Of course it's not, because it can be used for more operations, for example, if you're sterilizing equipment. So just a couple of pictures of those. This would be them sterilizing medical equipment. This would be them uh, treating cancer. So contamination is different. You need to know these definitions here. Contamination means when you get a radioactive source on you, radioactive atoms on you, attached to you, and then they can then release a dangerous alpha, beta, and gamma. Now, this can be useful if you want to see inside a human during a medical checkup. So you might drink a barium liquid to be able to see inside the stomach. Or maybe put some radioactive material through a water pipe to be able to look for leaks. So here is the inside of someone's intestine having drunk a radioactive liquid. And here is um, uh, some radioactive material going through a pipe to be able to detect leaks. Now, the properties of these that they're going to use will depend on, on, on what you want to achieve. So you definitely don't want to hurt a human uh, to be able to see inside them. So you're going to want a short half-life. Okay, you're going to want that to leave your system quite quickly. Okay, so a short half-life on that. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of foundation combined. So if you've been watching, really good luck in your uh, in your exam tomorrow if I'm doing foundation combined. We're now going to concentrate on the higher tier, which is not a lot of, just a few minutes of higher tier content. And then we're going to have a quick look at the separate content. So uh, thank you very much, guys. Okay, so first off in the higher tier um, combined part, um, you might need to describe a way to increase the efficiency of an intended energy transfer. So here we've got uh, adding oil to moving parts to reduce friction, okay, or adding insulation to a heating device, so a kettle or a water heater up in someone's loft. By adding these two things to those, to those two different processes, well, what are you doing? Well, you're just reducing the energy that's lost uh, to the surroundings as heat. So friction uh, would cause heat energy to be wasted. So adding oil just reduces that, that friction and adding thermal insulation just traps heat in a little bit more as well. OK, so you may also be asked to calculate the net decline um, expressed as a ratio in a radioactive emission after a given number of half lives. Sounds scary. It really isn't. So let's have a look at this. Half-life is the amount of time it takes uh, for the radioactive emissions to go down by half. Let's say we start off with 240 counts per second after one half-life, 120, then 60, then 30. How do we express this as a ratio then? Well, I've expressed it as a ratio and a percentage just to, just to have it all down there. So the decline, that means the reduction expressed as a percentage. So at the start, we've got 0% uh, decayed. So what would that be? 0 out of 240. After one half-life, half of them have decayed, 120 out of 240. So what would that be as a, as a ratio? One, uh, one, two, um, a 50 percent have decayed. So let's get rid of that. After two half-lives, now there were after one half-life, there was 120 left, and that 120 left has decayed again, meaning 180 have now decayed. So that is our uh, showing our net decline. That's what we've lost meaning 75 percent have decayed and then again 210 out of 240 etc okay so this is us dis displaying expressing our net decline as in how much has it gone down to uh, compared to with the original okay now you may also see it on a graph this is a nice way of looking at it so we've got here the number of daughter atoms the daughter is the product after it's decayed uh, compared to the number that we started with. Now, let's say we started with 240 million um, uh, atoms. Well, then after one half-life, we're going to have 120 million atoms. And as a ratio, uh, that would be 0 0.5. Okay, so after one half-life, we're down to 0 0.5. After another half-life, well, we've lost half of the half. So now we're up to 0 0.75. Okay, and just like the numbers were before on the last screen, we're now up to uh, 0 0.875 and so on. Okay, just expressing the ratio of how many we've lost compared to what we started with. Okay, thank you very much everyone who's combined. Uh, we're now just going to have a quick look at the separate uh, items. should take us uh, 10 or so minutes to just rattle through these. So thank you very much everyone who's combined higher. Well done for listening. Okay, higher tier content then. So let's have a look at our, um, sorry, separate content. Um, our gas pressure, Boyle's law, what's it, this all about then? So Boyle's law says that P times V equals a constant. So for a gas that's in a closed system, a box with particles in it, here we go, here's our box with particles in it, that the pressure times the volume is the same answer, gives us the same number, a constant number, for the same gas in these two different situations. When I say same gas, I mean the same mass of gas. So let's have a look over here. In this container here, uh, we've got a slightly larger volume. My pressure is 100 pascals. My volume is 1, 1 meter cubed. So 100 times 1. So my constant is going to be 100, meaning that hopefully, if I've calculated this correctly, that when I reduce the volume by half, my pressure should double, giving me the same constant. So here we go. My pressure is now 200. My volume is 0 0.5, meaning my constant is now still 100. Now, this can be useful, for example, if in a situation where they don't tell you what the pressure is here. So you'd be able to work it out because you know that P1, V1 equals P2, V2. 
and you would just fill in the blanks there. So 100 times 1 equals uh, P2 times 0 0.5. Okay, you would divide both sides by 0 0.5, uh, telling you that pressure would be P2 equals 200. Nearly made the mistake there of leaving my units off. Okay, now this relationship is inversely proportional. When I double pressure, volume halves. If I treble pressure, volume goes down three times. So you should see a graph that looks a bit like that. Now you can prove, if they were to show you this data, you can prove that any two, you can prove that this graph shows a directly proportional relationship by picking any two points on the graph. Now make your life easy by picking two points that fall on grid lines if you can. If they fall on grid lines, they'll be easier for you to for measure. So you pick two points on the graph, and now you've got your V1 and P1, and you're going to do P1 times V1, and that will give you a number. And then to prove that this is an inversely proportional relationship, pick another point on the graph, and that can be your P2, V2, and P2 times V2 should equal that same number. Okay, that's how to prove that it's inversely proportional. Okay, gas pressure. So there's a little bit of separate only content for this. So doing work on a gas. Doing work on a gas is really referring to applying a force to it. And it increases the internal energy of the gas. Okay, remembering internal energy is Ke plus um, potential energy, kinetic energy and potential energy of the gas. And it can cause an increase in the temperature of the gas. Well, why is that? When you apply force to a gas, so you compress it or squash it, you're doing work on the gas. When you do work on the gas, you're transferring energy into the gas. So remember that work done is the same as energy transferred. So by compressing a gas, like when you force it through a bicycle pump, you're transferring energy to it. Now this energy, what does it do? It increases the internal energy which is made of the kinetic energy and potential energy of the particles. So we'll increase the kinetic energy of the particles. It will increase their temperature. By forcing them through a small hole, you're doing work on the gas. It's going to make it hot. Okay, how to explain all of that in a... Well, how to explain all of that really in a sh nice short way. If you're asked to explain the effect of how a bicycle pump increases the temperature of a gas, this is how to do it. Three steps. When you apply force, you're doing work. Work done by the pump is the energy transferred to the internal energy of the gas. Now, what does that mean? The kinetic energy of the particles increase, so therefore the temperature increases. Okay, electric charge. So right at the end of the electricity topic is this uh, small part on um, static electricity. And the first part is the charge um, field lines from an isolated sphere. Isolated just meaning a, a, a sphere on its own like a van der Graaff generator. So here we go, here's a diagram showing us two charged spheres. They could be positively charged or negatively charged, that's the bit in the middle. And these lines here show us field lines, really similar to magnetic field lines. Now what do they show? Well, um, a couple of things. They show that the closer the lines, the stronger the field. So where's the field strongest? It's strongest round here. And of course that makes sense. When, you know, how do we, when does an object feel a force the strongest? Or it's when it's the closest to something that's, um, that's uh, charged. And also, the lines always go from plus to minus. So they'll come away from a plus, but they'll go into a minus. Now, we've seen questions before where they just have a sphere like that and they say draw the field lines on. You've got to know that they go plus to minus, so they'll go away from a plus, And you've got to draw enough of them on, not just four, draw quite a few of them on, each one with an arrow, just to show that you really understand, and each one should be about the same distance apart. Okay, should you ever see a negative charge being brought close to a negative charge, just like the North Pole and North Pole of a magnet and the field lines, the field lines will push apart from each other. Okay, showing that there will be a repulsion between these two. Uh, negatively charged objects and similarly over here here we've got a plus and a minus being brought together well now the field lines are going to go straight from plus to minus showing that there is a force of attraction there okay so opposites attract and like charges uh, repel okay and we must use those words attract and repel those are our key scientific words 
So if we were to charge an insulating rod with static electricity, how do we do that? Well, all you need to do is we need to use friction. Friction, by me rubbing the cloth on the rod, causes electrons to be transferred from one. Now that's the one that's going to become positive. If we're losing electrons from this cloth, the cloth overall have a positive charge left behind. And um, it's going to go to another one. So this rod here is going to become negatively charged. It's gaining the electrons. It's only electrons that move. When they leave something, they create positive charge. When they move to something, they create negative charge. Okay, and what is a spark then? And this is really the same as what is lightning. So sparking occurs when there is a large enough potential difference. Okay, when it's large enough, um, when a, a PD is large enough, a strong electric field, just like we've seen here, a strong electric field strips electrons from the air molecules. This is the electrons being stripped from the air molecules, and it causes a spark, uh, which is current flowing. Okay, so current is flowing because there are, uh, for example, lots of negative electrons over on this side. There's not any on this side. There is a large PD, potential difference. They're going to want to flow from one side over to the other, um, causing um, uh, electrons to be stripped from those air molecules, causing a spark. Okay, um, just another closer look at our required practical here for separate. So this is to do with measuring the uh, heat loss in... in um, in different insulating materials again take the temperature every 30 seconds uh, you may be asked to plot a graph the steeper the gradient um, the higher the rate of heat loss and a little bit of science about um, some of the of the methods of heat transfer you don't need to describe this in terms of particles but just to know that infrared radiation is stopped by shiny silver conduction and convection these are both forms of heat transfer uh, which are reduced by trapped air so these both need particles to work. Um, particles aren't very close together in air. And conduction and convection are also stopped by a vacuum. Why? Well, because in a vacuum there's no particles. So if there are no particles, that will uh, stop any conduction or convection. So you may also use air, because air is a poor conductor, and it can't flow if it's trapped. Both con conduction and convection require particles, and a vacuum has no particles. Okay, background radiation. Um, we can see here all of the background radiation that might be present in this room at the moment and we can see only a tiny proportion of it comes from man-made sources so artificial being man-made now you can see that of all the man-made ones nearly all of them are medical and there's a few here which are from nuclear power and weapons testing very very little so there is always a small amount of background radiation around us Mostly it's from natural causes, not very much of it is man-made. Now if you want to find out if um, this box here is radioactive, we can't just point a detector at it because the detector will always have background radiation on it. So the background reading needs to be subtracted from any reading when determining if something is radioactive or not. Okay, so first point it over there, find your background reading, then point it at the box, has it gone up? Okay, now there are some jobs which are more at risk than others. Because a lot of our uh, radiation comes from outer space, the high-risk professions are ones that work in the sky or in the space. So uh, airline staff are exposed to more radiation than most other jobs. The same for astronauts as well. Okay, last little part of our separate science then. Fission and fusion. Fission is used to heat water in a power station instead of burning fossil fuels. So uranium and plutonium. So they're still going to be used to um, heat water. That heat, that hot water is going to turn to steam. The steam will rush past uh, blades of a turbine, making that spin. And when that spins, that's going to be connected to a generator, okay, which is going to produce the electricity. Now, a little bit more about fission then. So what exactly is fission? Well, you're going to see that a large, unstable nucleus, here's my target nucleus, it's large, you must refer to it as a nucleus, it receives a neutron. Okay, when it receives a neutron, it becomes unstable, like we've seen before. Um, when it splits 
into two smaller nuclei, again, making sure to refer to nuclei. It splits into these two smaller nuclei and also releasing more neutrons. Now then, these neutrons can go on and repeat this process called a chain reaction. You may well be expected to replicate this drawing over, now when you do, you're copying exactly the same thing. So here we go, that neutron starts a chain reaction. We're gonna have a neutron. We're gonna have a slightly smaller nucleus again. And you're just copying what is over here. You're gonna have another neutron. You're gonna have a slightly smaller nucleus again. And then perhaps one more neutron. Okay, fusion, well that occurs in stars. And it's how all the elements in the universe are made. Now here we have um, small nuclei, again referring to them as nuclei, they're small, they fuse together. So here we have one proton with a neutron, here we have one proton with two neutrons, they're going to fuse together to form a larger nuclei. Now both of these processes release huge amounts of energy in the process. So it's this energy here that gives us the heat from the sun and the light from the sun, it's this energy here that produces our, um, our, uh, ele our, our energy for nuclear power inside power stations. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you've done really, really well to listen to all of that. Thank you very much. Feel free to, once it's uploaded, feel free to pause it, rewind and watch it again. It should be uploaded fairly shortly. Thanks for watching. Make sure tonight you eat a good meal, get a good night's sleep. Before the exam, definitely relax. Being relaxed is your friend. Being stressed is not. So make sure you take on board plenty of oxygen, lots of deep breaths, relaxed breathing. And guys, uh, everyone that I've worked with, thank you very much for working hard this year. Good night.